only are you trying to think one step ahead of yourself and everybody else, but you're trying to think about what everybody else is thinking about as well, so you're all moving together. And it can be quite difficult because it's not just standing there thinking about it, you're on the move all the time. They do allow little tiny errors, three I think it is, and then it becomes into a, a fail. But it is a bit strange, you know, knowing that you might have failed it already before you've even finished the thing. Nothing went right at all. It, it, the rest of the crew felt the same. I thought the rest of the crew did OK. Um, but personally, I had a terrible time out there. Um, so don't make any appointments Tuesday. Because <laughs> uh, I'm more or less certain we'll be back out. Well, I will be in there, I think. Thanks, General Sedan, please. OK, long day. But we have Lester scores for you. So read this straight out, however painful it may be. We'll go straight through the list. You know the list. You know exactly who's before you in the list. And you're counting it down. Johnny Diver, Derek Drummond, Duggan, and it's passed, and it's like, yes! And the relief, it's just like, it's, it is a weight off your shoulders. So, Mr. Blakemore, pass. Mr. Boyd, pass. Brindley, pass. Burke, pass. Butler, fail. Diver, pass. Drummond, pass. Duggan, pass. Evans, fail. Gamble, fail. Godfrey, pass. Law, pass. Manton, pass. Hello, Taylor, it's Daddy. Hello. Daddy's just found you up to tell you I passed my test. Oh, I don't know how many scores yet, but I've passed it by... But I've got it right anyway, so I'll, it's good, isn't it? Well, I won't stand. I'm fine, I'm fine. Just found to let you know I uh, passed my assessment today, my big one. So, it's gone okay, does it? Certainly are, yeah? Go for a few beers. It's the recruits' first night off in more than three weeks, but the fun's short-lived. Next week, the would-be firefighters get a taste of what it's like to go on a real call-out, ready and dressed for action. Anybody think you're dressing for a film premiere? Come on, let's have it sorted! As 1996 turned to 97, millions of people here in Australia were gripped by a real-life cliffhanger that was unfolding hourly on their television screens. It wasn't long before people in the rest of the world, especially in Britain and France, were sharing in that drama. The stories that emerged have been hailed as the most extraordinary in the history of survival and rescue at sea. The rescues took place in the Southern Ocean, which surrounds Antarctica and is one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Hurricane force winds and waves the size of houses lash anything that gets in their way. I spent 10 days on board one of these boats during the BT Global Challenge, and I saw for myself just how demanding the conditions can be. There can be as many as half a dozen sail changes in one four-hour watch. And with the four-day heaving and pitching, and maybe in the dark, it's a demanding job for a full crew. But there are those who choose to race alone. I suppose I, I'm an adventurer is what I am, and sailing is the medium that I, that I fulfill that streak. Pete Goss is a former Royal Marine who set up from France in November 1996 on a race called the Vendée Globe, a non-stop, single-handed sprint around the world, taking four months. I wanted to do the Vendée because it was the ultimate challenge. It is a very hard race. Statistically, only 50% of the fleet would finish it. Um, three lives have been lost um, already, so you really do have to respect it. But um, I had no, no fear at all. I mean, at the start, John, I couldn't wait to go. I couldn't wait to get stuck into it. I felt great, and I was f starting to fulfill a 10-year dream. What a lucky person. Mm. The race included the Englishman Tony Bullimore and the Frenchman Thierry Dubois, two men who would make headlines of their own, and 28-year-old Raphael Dignelli from France, the youngest of the 16 starters. When uh, I'm sailing and when I participate at the race, uh, it's my life. I am, I am very enjoy, I'm very happy. 
For his first ever round the world race, Daniele had the full backing of his wife. I gave up everything to help him because uh, it was quite hard to find money for partnership and to organize everything about the race. I wanted to share it with him. We always shared everything, so it's a family project. <laughs> I was making this video diary uh, for a television program, which is basically a camera. You, you film what you're doing and you talk to it and how you feel and so on. And it actually becomes a friend. <laughs> you start talking to this bloody piece of equipment. Well, as you can see, today is a, a very common day. There's a lot of things to be done. You have to cook, clean, look after yourself. Uh, you have to do a lot of maintenance. That takes a lot of your time up. And then, of course, just physically sailing the boat, getting on deck, changing sails. You have to be fit uh, and you have to be motivated. The first few weeks of the race took the boat south towards the equator. Well, here we are. Look at that. Run down the boom, nice sunny day. And hey ho diddly. There's the competition. Fantastic. Rafael Dinelli was going well, but finding the race tough. The, the, the first weeks is very hard for me and I think for every, every, every skipper. 20th of November, 2103 hours. Very tired. Another major problem this morning, a crack in the ballast tank. I'm fed up, one problem after another. I send every day a fax for Virginie and every day I say, I have a blues, uh, my head is not good. And I really thought, what the hell is he doing here? <laughs> He's not having fun at all. Communications uh, nowadays are very, very sophisticated, and you can send a fax anywhere in the world and people can fax you. We also have a form of safety communication, what we call an EPIRB, and it's a, a sealed unit. It's very, very rugged, and you can, you can flick a switch and a mayday and a position goes out. So if everything goes down, you are able to say, I'm in trouble, I need help, and this is where I am. At the moment, the leaders, Aquitaine Innovation is here. By then, the, the race had, had split into two groups, and we were in the, in the group further behind. And we are, um, we're here. Nothing like a bit of competition. <laughs> I pass uh, one month. I work every day, every night. I repair my sail, I repair my autopilot, I repair everything, everything, everything. My principal objective is to repair before the, uh, the south. The Southern Ocean represents the worst part of any round the world trip because that is where you get these very vicious storms. It is quite intimidating and you're going into the unknown, but it's a great adventure. I had never been before in the South Ocean. My first depression is very exciting for me. Oh, good surfing, yes, uh, good surfing. Yeah. There we are, look, that's easy, 15 knots. 16, 17, 17 and a half. There's nothing more exciting than surfing down, um, you know, a 60-foot wave at 30 knots. It's fantastic. 21st of December, Pete Goss has passed ahead of me. He's down 54 degrees south. He, he must be mad with all those icebergs. The sea temperature is down to uh, zero degrees and um, it's very cold. I've got driving snow on deck. Uh, I say, oh, crazy British, he's a crazy man. He go too fast, too, too south, crazy. I decided to don't pass 50 south and I stay on the line. This is my um, strategy. I was delighted with the boat, delighted with the boat speed and we were catching up. Doing really good, yes, yeah, great. Christmas Day started bright, clear, um, sunny day with a northerly wind, um, but I knew there was a storm coming. This is Christmas Day. I have a, a, a good, good wine, very old wine of Bordeaux. When I prepare the meal, I begin to feel mm, the condition is not, uh, is not normal. When you do these races, you, you always have one bad storm, and, and um, 
you instinctively know which one it is. It was obviously this one. I had this special meal, which I was going to have, but with the pressure dropping, it, it sort of um, dampened any festive spirit. And uh, so I, I decided I'd celebrate Christmas once it had passed through. The wind up, up very quickly, and I have not a, a good feeling. It was very intimidating. The wind went straight up to 50, 60 knots. The slowest I could make the boat go was um, 28, 30 knots. So it was all on the edge of control. I checked the boat. I knew everything was OK. There was nothing more I could do. And I just felt uncomfortable. But I had this awful premonition coming, uh, which was really quite unpleasant. The speed suddenly is too fast. 24, 25, 26 knots, no sail. And I say, ooh, it's no good, it's no good. The waves is more uh, 15 uh, meters. This wave, I have a big problem. My boat suddenly upside down, very hard. My first reaction is not my uh, my life. I say, oh, the race is the race is finished. <laughs> Raphael's boat was designed to write automatically, but it didn't, and he was trapped inside. I realize uh, the situation is too bad. I think uh, you, you must switch the switch of the beacon. RCC Australia, good evening. The signal was received uh, ahead, in France itself, in Europe, and relayed to us from the Maritime Rescue Centre. What's been happening, Ian? Uh, there's a yacht named Algemus, one person on board whose name Denali. Raphael was approximately 1,200 miles southwest of Fremantle, Western Australia. The situation posed a real problem. The nearest merchant ship was 34 hours away. So we issued a May Day to see if there was any shipping in the area which could lend immediate assistance to that vessel. The BT in Marsat system has started to beep. I called up the message and it was a May Day. And the definition of that is that it's a life-threatening situation. I never thought it would be one of the competitors. I don't know why. And I thought, <laughs> I thought, what is some daft sod doing down there? They hadn't all really sunk in, and the alarm went again, which basically said, Raphael is in trouble. What's your position and what's your situation? And I thought, shit, that is just what I need. <laughs> of all things, perfect timing. The problem was, I was 160 miles from Raphael, but I was downwind. I would have to turn around and, and take this boat back into what were pretty, pretty horrific conditions, and it wasn't designed for it. I had a real concern that if Pete didn't turn back into those conditions, we may have lost Raphael. It was Pete or bust. I sat down and I just thought through all the ramifications and, and the risks involved and you think of your family and all the rest of it. But it's, to me, I'm sure it's different with everyone. It, it would just flashed up like a signpost. You either stand by your principles or you don't. So when I first turned the boat around, I just watched the guardrails go under and, and the spreaders, you know, touch the water. And I just thought, if I was having troubles on the boat, how could he possibly be, be surviving, really? Incredible uh, story, incredible. My boat st stayed uh, upside, capside, three hours. After three hours, the boat upside down again, in good direction. My only solution is wait on the deck, and I have, uh, my feet is in the, in the water. But uh, I realize that my deck is uh, very, very broken. He always told me, don't worry, he can't sink. My boat is safe, it's the safest boat of the, of the race. When I realize um, the boat sinking, I think you must now go to the life raft. 
I open my my life raft and I attach my life raft with three line of Kevlar. It was very dangerous anywhere on the boat really, and I found that um, as waves were hitting the boat, I was being thrown around and was starting to get injured. I wasn't in control of the situation by then. The storm had taken control of events. I had to tie myself into a into the bunk in around the corner because I was being thrown around. And it was she'd either make it or she'd break up. The the force of the water is incredible. My life raft, the line broken, and I saw my life raft. I say, it's very, very bad. I was thinking my food, my all materials, flashlight is in my life raft. Stranded 1,200 miles from land, Raphael had no way of telling whether anybody had picked up his mayday. He made a last desperate pact with his sinking yacht, willing it to save his life. I passed a, con a, contra a contract with my boat. I said, listen, you, your life now is dead. But you, you don't die before when I survive. Next week, as Raphael fights for his life, the Australian Air Force joins the search. He could be being sunk, he could be dead. We just didn't know at that stage. Would I find um, an empty life raft? Uh, would I find a body in it? Uh, and what would I tell his wife and, and child? That cloud got bigger and bigger the closer I got to him. And an unexploded wartime bomb tests the stamina and courage of a young army officer on his first job. I was quite certain that if uh, something did go wrong, then I wouldn't know much about it. And to quote Blackadder, I'd probably jump 600 metres in the air and scatter myself all over Portland. To reserve your place on the 999 Lifesaver Roadshows in Newcastle and Edinburgh, call us now on 0891 339 999. If you have a flood story or some video, our address is 999 BBC Wycladies Road, Bristol, BS8 2LR. You'll find more details about tonight's programme on our website and CFAX pages. How is her fire? Have you made it work? Stop this at once! We must go home. She will listen to you. You are a bit. A dangerous attraction in a world of oppression. If I thought you'd let him go and hidden it, you would be bitterly sorry. A respectable trade. Continues Sunday at 9.20 on BBC One. Another collection of calamities in 35 minutes here on BBC One. Terry Wogan unveils more of Auntie's sporting bloomers. A memorable sparring match now on BBC One. Another chance to see Mrs Merton go the distance with Chris Eubank.